Let me uh, say how honored I am to be the um, Eliezer Fletcher Memorial Lecturer. I didn't know Eliezer, but he has indeed a beautiful smile. And I can tell from that <laughs> that he was a very special man. And your, your introduction gave us that impression of what a special man he was. So I am indeed honored to be the memorial lecturer, first, I guess, memorial lecturer here. Second, let me thank uh, Varda and the organizers um, for this wonderful invitation. And third, let me say this is my first time at Bar Ilan University, so I'm almost collected every university, I think, in Israel now that I have spoken at. Uh, but maybe if you invite me back a few more times, I'll saturate the growing number of universities and medical schools that Israel has. Uh, I want to divide my talk into two parts. Uh, the first part will be uh, an overview and the introduction of uh, how it is that the P53 protein uh, is activated so that it functions in the cell for us to protect us against cancer. It is, of course, a, a, an important tumor suppressor. And, and secondly, I want to take up on what Moshe <laughs> used as his introduction and talk a little bit about a surprising new kind of uh, stress uh, that activates P53. And so the second part of the talk will be a, a, a new part of the upstream events in the activation of P53. Let me begin by reminding you that uh, P53 is an important tumor suppressor that helps prevent cancers in human beings and in animals. Um, and it, it does so by being a fidelity factor. Um, and that's a, quite an interesting uh, point. It uh, keeps the uh, replication of the cell cycle, the replication of DNA, the division of cells, the segregation of chromosomes, it keeps all of that faithful in spite of the stresses that we constantly encounter. So what are these stresses? Because that's what really will be the subject of, of my talk today. Uh, what are the stresses? And they're listed here in this first slide. You can see there are wide, first of all, a tremendous wide variety of different kinds of stresses. Uh, probably chief among them are DNA damages. But DNA damage is divided up into different kinds of DNA damage. The reactive oxygen species make single and double-stranded DNA. A gamma radiation breaks the DNA into single and double-stranded DNA. UV radiation, thymine dimers, and cytosine hydrates. Uh, there are uh, ligands which react with bases and which acetylate them and which methylate them. And uh, and these bases uh, uh, behave in abnormal fashions. And each one of these kinds of DNA damage has a different pathway to recognizing the activation of P53. Now, by activation, I mean the following. P53 is a transcription factor. It lies dormant in the cell uh, with a very low level of transcription. And uh, upon the exposure to DNA damage, for example, like UV irradiation, P53 levels rise, the concentration goes up very rapidly within minutes, and the protein is modified by various forms of modifications like phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation, ubiquitination, sumylation, and so forth. And these modifications all contribute to activating the P53 protein as a factor then binds to specific DNA sequences next to adjacent genes, transcribes those sequences, makes proteins, and carries out a response to the stress. And there are three kinds of responses you can see on the slide here in the lower, your lower right-hand corner. Uh, either there's apoptosis, that is to say the cell is killed in response to DNA damage, for example. There's senescence, which is a kind of terminal differentiation of the, uh, <coughs> of the cell, or there's cell cycle arrest. Uh, the cell cycle arrest prevents the division process from continuing, allows for repair, for example, of DNA damage, and then you can re-enter the cell cycle and continue this division. Now, why is this an important tumor suppressor, uh, given the, the fact that the DNA damage itself right, occurs very commonly? 
Well, it's an important tumor suppressor because every one of these stresses that you see here, DNA damage, hypoxia, ribonucleoside triphosphate depletion, spindle damage, nitric oxide signaling, which is signaling that comes from the immune system, and chronic inflammation, for example, nutrient deprivation, heat or cold shock, or even the mutation of oncogenes, the activation of oncogenes, each of these signals to P53 and activates it. Now, that's a tremendous diversity, uh, and each of them has its own signal transduction pathway. Each stress has its own signal transduction pathway between sensing the stress, transmitting the signal that the stress has occurred, and activating P53. Now, every one of these stresses will raise the mutation rate in the cell. So DNA, if you try to replicate damaged DNA, there's a thousand-fold increase in the error rate. Uh, hypoxia, there's hundreds of fold increase in error rates. Spindle damage, there's segregation distortions. Right? Heat and cold shock, there's distortions and errors in the replication cycle, the division cycle. So uh, what P53 is doing is sensing stresses which will increase the frequency of mutation or uh, increase the frequency of cancers and preventing them from occurring by apoptosis, senescence, or cell cycle. And I'm going to stress now the different pathways between, let's say, DNA damage, uh, between uh, nutritional deprivation and the activation of P53. Now, P53 is regulated post-translationally, which is an interesting way to regulate the protein. Uh, it's regulated by a ubiquitin ligase called MDM2. So P53 is mono and polyubiquitinated by MDM2. When it's polyubiquitinated, it goes to the proteasome and it's degraded. The half-life of P53 in most cells is six minutes to 20 minutes. And this very short half-life means the concentration is quite low. The first thing to say is that every single stress has its mechanism of action through the MDM2 ubiquitin ligase. All right, so this really should have been called the MDM2 pathway, not the P53 pathway, I think, originally, but P53 was found first. All right? And all the stresses signal through the ubiquitin ligase. Uh, some stresses activate or increase the ubiquitin ligase, and they inhibit P53's function by decreasing P53 concentration. Other stresses inactivate MDM2, and then P53 concentrations rise because its ubiquitin ligase is now inhibited, so that as it goes from six minutes to 12 minutes, you double the concentration. And now you see the value of a post-translational response. That value of a, a rapid methylation, acetylation, phosphorylation of MDM2, for example, right, inactivates MDM2, P53 levels rise, Within 12 minutes, they double. Within 24 minutes, they quadruple. Right? And then the modifications of P53 themselves help program the transcripts that lead to apoptosis, senescence, or cell cycle. So the first question is, uh, why is it that dozens and dozens of different stresses that all raise the mutation rate and can have a detrimental effect upon cell cycle fidelity why is it that they all funnel through a single node in the pathway, right? That, that seems to be a very vulnerable design if you think about it, because a mutation in P53 makes the cell blind to DNA damage, hypoxia, spindle deprivation, spindle damage, nutrient deprivations, oncogene activations, right? Why is it that a single node is chosen to integrate all of these different stresses? And the answer is, first of all, we really don't know why that's true. Uh, but wh what a single node does do for you is it integrates the signals. So if you have different kinds of DNA damage, P53 knows it. And it knows it because there are different signal transduction pathways for UV damage and gamma radiation. And those different pathways result in different modifications in MDM2 and P53, and it can integrate the different kinds of stresses because the single molecule is regulating the, re <coughs> the response to stress, for example. So 
That's one explanation for why a, a, a vulnerable pathway or node exists, but this vulnerability results in uh, really a, a, an appalling number of mutations in the p53 gene for cancers. So about 50% of all cancers have p53 mutations, and probably 70 to 80%, maybe 90% of all cancers have an activated p53 function in one way or another. And this node is a, a, a terrifically important node, therefore, for preventing cancers. We can see that in the uh, small number of people who are born with mutations in the p53 gene in the germline. This is a leaf called the leaf Ramini syndrome uh, with about 100% penetrance, 95% penetrance. These people will develop cancers over their lifetime, at, usually at younger ages, and some of the individuals with p53 mutations will develop five or six different cancers, independent cancers over their lifetime. So it's really rather clear in, in humans that p53, by being a fidelity factor, by responding to these stresses, in fact, uh, is a critical node in preventing cancers. So let's just take a minute or two to discuss some of the different ways all the signal transduction pathways, the upstream events, if you will, the events between stress and p53 that activate p53 in response to stress, uh, because this is the first part of the p53 pathway. Right, this is the MDM2 uh, one-dimensional structure. Uh, uh, MDM2 is 491 uh, amino acids long here. And in the amino terminus in the gray region, there is a P53 binding domain. So this is the ubiquitin ligase for P53. The binding domain is the place where the P53 protein binds to this protein. There is the next two gray areas, the nuclear localization signal, and a nuclear exit signal, all right? Now, the NLS and the NES allow the MDM2 protein to shuttle between the nucleus and the cytoplasm, and that shuttling can sequester P53 in the cytoplasm and inactivate its functions as a transcription factor. There is, close to the NES, a nucleolar localization signal as well, so that MDM2 can have many different cellular locations. There's a prominent acidic domain and a zinc finger domain that's followed, and this, these are binding sites for a variety of proteins that I'll tell you about in a few minutes, right? And finally, the ring finger domain at the carboxy terminus is where the uh, ubiquitin ligase activity is, where it interacts with ubiquitin ligases and interacts, uh, that region, uh, mono and polyubiquitinates P53. Uh, a little bit of the three-dimensional structure of the MDM2 P53 protein complex is shown here. Uh, on the bottom, on your bottom left, the white region is the region of uh, MDM2, and it has a very deep cleft where the P53 protein, the yellow region in this case, binds into the deep cleft. Notice the the Helix, the P53 protein, is an alpha helical protein, induced actually alpha helical protein at this particular spot. And it's an amphipathic helix which has hydrophobic groups sticking into the hydrophobic cleft. Uh, so that uh, F19 is phenylalanine 19, W23 is tryptophan 23, leucine 26, proline 27 are all critical amino acids for the binding of P53 to the MDM2 protein. Uh, amino acid mutations of these proteins prevent the binding of P53 to MDM2. And you can see three different views of this cleft in the top, in the right-hand side, and in the left-hand side, with the three critical amino acids sticking into the cleft. What's quite interesting is these three amino acids uh, phenylalanine 19, tryptophan 23, leucine 26. These three amino acids are critical for the transcriptional activation of P53. So the very binding of P53 to MDM2, even before the polyubiquitination, actually inhibits, in a repressor-like fashion, inhibits the transcription with, of P53. So there's a very rapid 
inhibition of P53 by MDM2 by binding the key amino acids for transcription, followed by polyubiquitination. Okay. So the first transcriptional pathway, the first pathway that exists between, let's say, ultraviolet irradiation or uh, gamma irradiation, right, and P53 is as follows. So if you irradiate DNA with gamma radiation, uh, then single or double-stranded breaks occur. The ATM, protein kinase, senses these breaks, goes to the region of the DNA where there are breaks, makes a dimer. The dimer phosphorylates each other. That activates ATM. An activated ATM actually phosphorylates P53. It phosphorylates it at critical amino acids which are interesting and important for dissociating P53 from MDM2. So serine 15, which is close to the site where P53 binds MDM2, is phosphorylated and it weakens the P53 MDM2 complex, for example. Uh, but ATM also phosphorylates MDM2, and when it phosphorylates MDM2, it inhibits its activity. Right. Uh, after UV irradiation, it's the ATR uh, protein kinase, that does essentially the same thing. It activates P53, inactivates MDM2. Uh, ATM also phosphorylates and activates ABL in response to DNA damage. And ABL, a tyrosine protein kinase, phosphorylates MDM2 and inhibits it as well. So notice what's happening. Uh, the whole cascade of protein kinases that sense DNA damage of various sorts inhibit MDM2, activate P53, and in that fashion, uh, they will increase the concentration of P53 and activate it. Uh, it's a, quite interesting that this is a self-limiting process. It should be an, a self-limiting process. P53 transcribes a gene called WIP1. That's a phosphatase. WIP1 removes the phosphate groups from P53, inactivating it, and MDM2 activating it, and then causes the whole process to calm down after DNA damage can be repaired. So it's potentially reversible through the WIP1 process. Uh, this is the relationship between P53 and a really interesting signal transduction pathway, the insulin-like growth factor pathway. Uh, this is a pathway that senses glucose concentration, senses amino acid concentration. So it's sensing environmental nutrients, right? Therefore, the nutrient effect. Right. It also is the pathway that sets the whole pathway up for uh, glycolysis to occur, for oxidative phosphorylation to occur. It's a pathway which regulates glucose metabolism in an intimate fashion, so that any, any tyrosine kinase receptor activates uh, the PI3 kinase protein. Right? In this case, it's the insulin-like growth factor one recept receptor, an insulin-like growth factor, uh, the PI3 kinase protein makes PIP3, phosphonositol triphosphate, and PIP3 is a small ligand, fatty ligand, right, lipid ligand, which activates PDK, which activates the protein kinase called AKT1, right? Uh, AKT1 phosphorylates MDM2, and in so doing increases MDM2 activity which inhibits P53 activity. So the commitment to cell growth through the PI3 kinase pathway inhibits P53 activity, which is a commitment to stopping cell growth and a commitment to apoptosis, right? So there's a reciprocal relationship. On the other hand, if you have a stress signal, that stress signal activates P53, like DNA damage. P53 then turns on the transcription of two genes, P10, which is a phosphatase for PIP3, shutting down the insulin-like growth factor pathway, and 1433 sigma, which is a protein that sequesters the AKT protein to the cytoplasm and prevents it from phosphorylating MDM2. So here's a great example of these two competing pathways, the insulin-like growth factor pathway, important in growth, and the P53 pathway, important in stress responses, working in reciprocal fashions, one to shut off the other, and in so doing, either allowing cell growth and division or permitting cessation of cell growth and division. 
So that regulation of that, these two pathways is, talks to each other in, in, in strong communication. Uh, parenthetically, P53 acts upon the other area of the insulin-like growth factor pathway, for example, TSC1 and TSC2, and TSC2 and the a beta subunit of AMP kinase, two critical kinases and G protein regulators, right, in the, this pathway are regulated by P53 because P53 transcribes those genes. All right. Um, let me go backwards. Yeah. Uh, let me go to a, yet a third kind of stress response, and that is ribosomal biogenesis stress. Uh, just as the insulin-like growth factor pathway is absolutely essential to increase the mass of cells so that cyclins increase in their concentration so that cells can progress through the cell cycle, it's absolutely essential to have enough ribosomes to support cell division and protein, the rate of protein synthesis. And if anything happens that prevents ribosomes from being made, let's say the exposure to the drug actinomycin D. Actinomycin D actually preferentially binds to AT-rich regions in the DNA. Uh, ribosomal RNAs are AT-rich. It will bind in the nucleolus to ribosomal RNAs, prevent those RNAs from being made, and suddenly you have a ribosome stress. You're not making enough ribosomes. And when you don't make enough ribosomes, there would be terrific errors in the division of cells. And so this activates P53 and shuts down the cell cycle. Now, how does it activate? 5-fluorouracil, uh, by the way, which is used for uh, uh, colon cancer treatments, 5-fluorouracil incorporates into the ribosomal RNAs and makes faulty ribosomal RNAs. And in so doing, you don't get proper processing of ribosomal RNAs, and you don't get ribosome biogenesis. If the tumor has wild-type P53, it's activated and will kill the tumor cells. Right? Now, how does this happen? Well, there are a whole list of ribosomal proteins here called uh, ribosomal uh, RP is ribosomal protein, RPL is the large ribosomal subunit, RPS is the small ribosomal subunit. So proteins on the large ribosomal subunit, L5, L... 11, L23, and the small subunit, S3, S7, S14, S27, and a S27-like protein, ribosomal-like protein, those proteins are in excess now if you're not building ribosomes because they're being synthesized. Those proteins bind to MDM2, they increase its activity, they decrease its activity, sorry, in binding to MDM2, and in so decreasing its activity, P53 levels go up, and it prevents cell division from progressing. Right? So here's a great example of ribosome, how ribosome number and content is being watched as a stress by P53. And finally, I'll just quickly point out that a number of microRNAs, uh, MIR-143, 145, MIR-106, uh, actually are made by P53, and those microRNAs, some of those microRNAs inhibit MDM2 right, in a positive feedback loop. Or there are some made by P53 which in, are, get inhibited by P53, and those inhibit MDM2, so it, it also activates P53 in so doing. Right? Or an inhibitor inhibitor of MDM2 means MDM2 is made in large amounts and P53 is in, inhibited. So, uh, here's a great example of microRNA regulation of the MDM2 P53 complex. We don't yet understand what regulates many of these microRNAs, and so we don't understand the nature of the stresses signaling to them. Right? Now, uh, so there are many different paths from different kinds of stresses, and I think the second, while the first fact is there's a single node the MDM2 node and the P53 node that this goes through, the, the second fact is the variety of stresses that there are. There are enormous variety of stresses taken care of by P53. It has encompassed a lot of the infidelity in the, in the cell, if you will. Now, uh, we have uh, been continuously looking for different kinds of stresses, and one of the stresses that intrigued us is the literature is filled with uh, 
one or two or three examples, right, in different kinds of psychological stress. So depression is a good example of a psychological stress or constant stress or lack of sleep is another example of a stress which results in a epidemiological report of higher incidence of cancer, right? Suggesting the possibility that there is some mechanism that links psychological stresses to cancer in some way. Now, this can't be linked through magic. It has to be linked through some chemical pathways. And so we decided to try to test this hypothesis. And here's two chemical pathways which can link psychological stress. Uh, chronic restraint is a good example of that. If a mouse is, is restrained in, a, in the amount of space it has to wander around in and, and explore, the mouse undergoes stress. The same thing would happen with a human who is uh, put in a, 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 an area which is chronically restraining the person, the person's stress levels go up. And you can measure stress levels by measuring either the catecholamines, if it comes through the sympathetic adrenal medulla axis, or by measuring the glucocorticoid hormones cortisol or corticosterones if it comes through the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortex system, right? So uh, any animal or human under stress is signaling chemically that it's under stress. And so there is a chemical reaction upstream of stress, and the question becomes, are any of these kinds of chemicals playing a role in activating P53. That would be the hypothesis. So the first thing we wanted to see is whether or not increased cortisone levels, cortisol levels in the mouse through chronic restraint would in fact give rise to a P53 dependent tumor genesis. And this experiment tests that hypothesis. Uh, First of all, the mouse we use is a heterozygous P53 mouse. It has one wild type allele and one mutant allele. That means it has half the concentration of P53. This mouse is extremely sensitive to a radiation damage because it has only half the concentration of P53. It is the equivalent in the mouse world of a lee fraumini syndrome in, in humans, right? So if a C57 black heterozygous mouse is put under periodic chronic restraint and then irradiated with four gray. Four gray is enough to give rise to tumors after a very long period if the mouse is a wild type mouse, has two copies of P53, but a shorter time with wild type. And you can actually see this, the black line that carries out, this is days versus the percentage of mice that develop tumors, right? And, and their survival, right? Uh, the black line says it takes, uh, uh, let's say, the control mouse 541 days or 77 weeks to develop tumors, right? Uh, the red line is the heterozygous mouse, normal heterozygous mouse, and it takes 340 days or 49 weeks, and that has a p-value of 0 0.0001, 10 to the minus fourth, control versus irradiated. So you can see that the P53 mouse is extremely sensitive to DNA damage because it has half the copies of uh, P53. And now the chronic restraint mouse. The chronic restraint mouse, uh, who is not irradiated, will develop tumors within, because it's a heterozygous mouse, 522 days or 75 weeks instead of 77 weeks. And that's, there's no significant difference between chronic restraint and control if you don't irradiate. But the blue line, that is to say chronic restraint plus irradiation, is 267 days versus 340 days, right? Or 38 weeks versus 49 weeks, and that is significant at a 10 to the minus four uh, p-value. Uh, on the bottom, you see that there are the tumors that are formed, splenic lymphoma, thymic lymphoma, sarcomas, and they are about the same tumors whether you have chronic restraint or not. They are the tumors that are formed by radiation in these mice. So this says that chronic restraint or a mouse that has high cortisol levels because of that restraint right, is going to be more sensitive than a mouse that's just irradiated and will develop tumors at an earlier time frame 
than the mouse that doesn't have chronic restraint. That's a psychological stress, if you will, and with this mouse. Right. Here's looking at the P53 levels from the spleen of those mice. You can look at, uh, in, in the mouse, the serine 15 I told you about is serine 18. So the P53 phosphorylation of serine, for example, if you look all across in the, in the top here, this is the western blot, right? You can see that uh, with a radi without irradiation, you can hardly see P53. With irradiation now, the P53 levels rise very highly. And the first three are without chronic restraint, and the next three are with chronic restraint. And what you can see is the much lower levels of P53 phosphorylation. And following right below it, the much lower levels of P53. And then this is quantitated by ELISAs in extracts, where you get the exact same result. You get, in every case, statistically about a twofold decrease in the levels of P53 in these cells when the mice are uh, chronically restrained. These are the, jet, the downstream genes that P53 transcribes under these conditions. P21 is a cell cycle arrest gene. Noxa and Puma are pro-apoptotic genes. You can see that with the control CON, you get a certain level of RNA induced in the tissues of these mice, and you get about a 40% decrease or 50% decrease of Noxa, of Puma, and of P21. Again, there is a lower response when the mice are psychologically stressed. Right. Uh, this is a, a way to look at apoptosis. This is uh, an assay for looking at apoptosis. This is a tunnel assay. This is a, a terminal transferase assay that looks for breaks in the DNA. And you can see that as you go from left to right, you have restraint alone in P53 wild type mice or on the bottom, P53 knockout mice, so the bottom is the background effects. You're looking for dark dots that are not found in the background, uh, in the top layer. Uh, if you have uh, uh, induced irradiation and chronic restraint, right, you can see less of these dark dots. If you have induced irradiation without restraint, you see more of the dark dots. That's the far corner versus the next one over. And what this tells you is that apoptosis is more efficient without chronic restraint, right? and therefore, with restraint, apoptosis is inhibited, and tumor genesis proceeds at a higher rate. So not only is Noxa and Puma, the genes that mediate apoptosis, down by 50%, so is the tunnel assay down by about 50%. Right? And this is a quantification of that you can see about a 50% drop or a 40% drop in the, at 12 hours and 24 hours in the P53-dependent apoptosis of mice with chronic restraint. Now, this is a different assay altogether, and it'll take some explanation, so I will go through it, but let me pause for a minute and, and conclude what, what has been found. That mice under psychological stress, perhaps like humans under psychological stress, are more prone when exposed to a mutagen or a carcinogen, like gamma radiation in these particular studies, are more prone to develop tumors, a higher rate of tumors, at an earlier time. And that correlates very efficiently with the lower levels of P53 due to the chronic restraint. I'll test that with cortisol in a minute, but this is another way to show the same thing. Now, in this particular case, uh, one has a nude mouse, and you're looking at tumors growing in the nude mouse, right? And these tumors are in controls or in mice that have been restrained. Now, these are xenografts. These tumors come from, they're human tumors, they come from tissue culture. The tumor tissue itself has nothing to do with the chronic restraint. It's the mouse that has to do, the host suddenly has chronic restraint, right? So we're asking questions about the growth of tumors in mice which have been restrained and therefore have high cortisol levels versus the growth of tumors in mice which in fact are not restrained, right? And therefore have low cortisol levels. So it's the host that's supplying the cortisol, right? 
Now, we're using two kinds of tumors. We're using a, a tumor called HCT116, right? This is a colon tumor, which either has P53, that's P53++, or it does not have P53, that's P53 minus minus. You can see that in the mice, pictures of the mice here, in the tumors in the mice, right? You can see that, in fact, in the tumors here, when the tumors are cut out and weighed to get their weight, right? And you can see the tumor volume, which is measured in these mice, at the graphs below. So the first graph on your left, right, is just an, a control mouse. It's a normal mouse. Right? But the tumor is either P53 wild type or P53 mutant. Right? And a, a knockout, a null. And you can see that the mutant grows very rapidly and the wild type grows more slowly. That's this difference between the rate of growth of the null versus the wild type. And that already says that P53 wild type in a tumor is slowing the rate of growth. It's doing it through P21, it's doing it through apoptosis. It doesn't like tumors and it kills tumors. So you can see that difference in just the normal mouse of the role of P53 in tumor growth. It's better to have wild type P53 usually than, than mutant. And you can see that in the size of the tumors where P53++ either restrained or not gives different sizes. Now the middle panel, all right, looks at the difference between the P53 wild type, the wild type P53 growing in a mouse that's restrained, had been restrained, or a mouse that's, that is control. So here's the control, that's the lower one, right? That, that is just like this lower one, it's wild type P53. You can see they're about the same, the lower one. And then what happens when it's in a mouse that had been restrained? Well, uh, P53 levels go down in the restrained mouse, and so the tumor grows more rapidly, and you can see that very efficiently. Now, in the third panel, what we have is a P53 knockout mouse. So suddenly, the target of restraint has disappeared. The target of cortisol has disappeared, and now the two lines come closer together. And it's that differential between the growth rate in the middle panel and the growth rate in the far panel that says that the target is really P53. Right? Now, let me say you can actually see the size of the tumors here. Right? And you can see that even in the absence of P53, right, restraint allows a little bit more growth than does the control. And that means that P53 is not the whole story. There are additional factors. I'm going to bet that's the immune system. We heard nice talk about NK cells, or we heard talks about the role of the immune system, and I'm going to bet, because cortisol has some immunosuppressive effects, right, that we're going to be talking about a combination of things, but P53 plays a big role. Right. Now, I'm going to I can move very rapidly just to demonstrate to you that it's not the restraint that's important, it's the cortisol that's important. So here's a mouse that's been injected with cortisol. It's not gone through any kind of uh, so restraint, right? And you can see here on the left and on the right, as you increase the cortisol concentration from 0 to 50 to 200 nanomolar, and as you irradiate it, P53 levels fall, right? P53 phosphorylated serine, these are human cells in culture. Serine falls, right? P53 levels fall, P21, the downstream gene regulated by P53 falls, right? So in every case, uh, cortisol acts just like the restraint. Now, cortisol acts in some way. It's not a chemical that is inert. It binds to the glucocorticoid receptor, and the glucocorticoid receptor moves to the nucleus and transcribes genes. Now, there's an inhibitor of the glucocorticoid receptor called RU486. This is the after morning pill, right? RU486 is an inhibitor of the glucocorticoid receptor. And here we've added the inhibitor, right, at 200 nanomolar, right? We've either, in the first two cases, have not added RU246, in the third case, have added it. And what you can see is that the experiment, the zero cortisol, right, no RU246, irradiation, you get lots of P53, serine 15, lots of P53, 
you add the cortisol alone, no RU486, you get a reduction in P53. Now you add RU486 and the level of P53 goes back up. So cortisol acts through the glucocorticoid receptor to actually transcribe genes which are then going to inhibit P53. If you block the glucocorticoid receptor, you return effective P53 levels. Now this actually has an important clinical implication. It suggests that RU486 could be used with chemotherapy in, in patients that are under stress, right? That's a suggestion of these experiments. Not a proof, but a suggestion. And this just measures the levels of how it goes down with cortisol and back up with RU486. You can see that pretty clearly. Uh, this just measures the P53 mediated apoptosis when treated with RU486. Uh, so not only does P53 levels go down and then back up with RU486, but apoptosis goes down and then back up with RU486. So not only is the P53 active activity increasing, but its downstream effect, apoptosis, is increasing, inhibiting the tumor growth under these conditions, right? Okay. Uh, this is just to show corticosterone acts in the same way that cortisol acts. Uh, here's an example of the 0, 50, and 200 nanomolar uh, corticosterone. Uh, humans tend to make more cortisol and less corticosterone. Mice tend to make more corticosterone and less cortisol but they're interchangeable as stress-related molecules that you can, you can measure. Right. And now uh, corticosterone decreases P53 levels in response to IR radiation in mice. You could just see this by adding the corticosterones, just as you could P53 in the spleen, in the thymus, in the small intestine. This just shows the robustness and reproducibility with either of these two chemicals, which uses the glucocorticoid receptor. And finally, uh, one could look at P53-dependent apoptosis in mice treated with corticosterone injections. And here again, you can see the corticosterone, the bottom is plus and minus, and then the irradiation, minus and plus. And as you can see, when you have minus corticosterone and plus radiation, you have the biggest effect of the tunnel assay, decreased apoptosis. And when you have corti corticosterones, you have a decrease in apoptosis based on this tissue section of the particular tissue that you're looking at, whether it's a normal tissue or whether it's actually a tumor tissue in this particular case. Okay. Um, now, what is, the, what is the glucocorticoid cortisone receptor transcribe that turns down P53? That's the next question. And one of the genes the glucocorticoid receptor with cortisol transcribes is a gene called SGK1, serum glucocorticoid kinase 1, right? And here you can see its effect. Uh, this is mouse embryo fibroblasts are here. This is spleen from the mice uh, uh, here in the next two lanes. And you can see when cortisol is added and you look at the relative RNA levels of the SGK1 protein kinase, it increases two to three-fold. This is the time kinetics. Within two hours, it's increased two-fold. By eight hours, it's about two-and-a-half-fold increased. And that's true whether it's in the mouse embryo fibroblasts and culture or the spleen cells where you have cortisol or restraint, either one, right? Both of them increase the SGK1 levels of messenger RNA and protein that are found in the cell. And SGK1 is like the AKT protein kinase in that it phosphorylates MDM2. And when it phosphorylates MDM2, like the AKT kinase, it increases its activity, decreasing P53 levels. So let's look at that. All right. Here's the SGK1 mediates inhibitory effects of glucocorticoids on P53. All right. uh, SGK1 levels. Uh, go up, you can see that, SGK1. This is just, this is a positive expression, overexpressing a cDNA clone of SGK1. If you overexpress it, right, you decrease P53 compared to this lane where you're not overexpressing it. So you can just see that transfecting the cDNA in 
is sufficient to decrease p53 in the cell and that's true the reciprocal is true for the knockdown experiment when you have an si rna for sgk1 then you increase p53 levels that's all the way on the right hand side here if you compare it without and with one has a radiation you increase the levels again of the p53 compared to the control so here's the control in the middle right and here's the increase with the siRNA so if you overexpress sgk1 sgk1 you get lower p53 levels if you inhibit sgk1 you get greater p53 levels so that tells you there's a direct relationship and that it's through mdm2 is shown here uh, we what sgk1 does is phosphorylate serine 166 and 186 on mdm2 that's exactly the same serines that akt is phosphorylating and has the same result that it increases its activity right and here you can see the increase in activity right at 0 2 8 and 15 hours of the serine right here you see the mdm2 levels remain the same it's just the increase in the phosphorylation uh, that occurs and then you can see that both in mouse embryo fibroblasts and human cells you can see as you go from 0 to 2 to 8 to 15 hours an increase in phosphorylation while the mdm2 levels remain the same so the sgk the glucocorticoid kinase the serum glucocorticoid kinase 1 phosphorylates mdm2 at the exact same spot as akt1 right and in so doing it actually inhibits the activity um, here's a an, another example of that in MEFs and in wild type p53 sgk1 mediates induction of phosphorylation at those two levels and you can see that in the control and you can see that when we add cortisol to the medium so let me summarize by going through the pathway that has been reconstructed uh, this is yet another stress signal in this case it's a psychological stress that liberates cortisol or corticosterones right the elevated glucocorticoids interact with the glucocorticoid receptor that transcribes the gene sgk1 which phosphorylates mdm2 which inhibits p53 and when p53 is inhibited you promote growth of uh, irradiation induced tumor genesis now I've left plenty of room for additional mechanisms here by putting an, an arrow to the other side where there's a, 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 a question mark because remember the growth of the tumor was not identical in these two cases with and without cortisol right so it certainly could be that the immune system continues to play a role and other things play a role but rather clearly psychological stress plays a role in these activations of p53 or inactivations uh, the people who did this work are listed here uh, they come from two different labs that we collaborate with this was actually work begun in my laboratory and continued in Wenwei Hu and Zhao Wei Fang's laboratories they're now independent assistant professors uh, Wenwei Hu and her three collaborators in the her research lab and Zhao Wei Fang and his three collaborators in his research lab are really responsible for the great majority of this work and without it without them it would never have been done thank you